In 1992, Steven Seagal starred in Under Siege, an action flick that grossed over $150 million worldwide. Eleven years later, he starred in The Foreigner, a movie with a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Basically, this guy has come a long way down since the 1990s. But in addition to his messy movie career, Seagal has been involved in a long string of weird incidents both behind the scenes and off the set entirely. While his career is often derided by critics, there's no denying Seagal lives one wild life. Steve, the onset diva. According to multiple actors, Steven Seagal is an incredibly difficult co-worker. John Leguizamo found out the hard way. While in rehearsals for Executive Decision, Leguizamo laughed at something Seagal had said, so Steven responded with an executive decision of his own. And he came up and he, he taekwondoed my ass against a brick wall. He's six foot five and caught me off guard and knocked all the air at me. I was like, oh, right. why? Why? Then there's The Glimmer Man, where the script calls for Seagal's character to kill a serial murderer, played by legendary character actor Steven Tobolowsky. Am I right or am I right or am I right? Right, right, right. Seagal decided he didn't want to kill so many people in movies anymore, and even tried convincing Tobolowsky that his serial killer character should live. The scene was eventually filmed as written, and Tobolowsky's murderer met his maker. My entire chest explodes, like my heart explodes, like blood flies out at the camera and I fall out of frame and smoke rises. Of course, as filming progressed, Seagal improvised lines about how he sure was glad he didn't kill that guy in the church. The film's director called Tobolowsky in to record some extra dialogue to make it seem like his character's on-screen death was a little less permanent. What'd he settle on? I ended up shouting up, Finish me off, you son of a b- <laughs> Come on, don't leave me like this! Kill me! Breaking Bond Steven Seagal has done quite a bit of fight choreography. According to IMDb, most of the films he's choreographed are his own, but in the early 80s, Seagal worked on the James Bond film Never Say Never Again, having been brought on board to teach Sean Connery some Aikido. Meanwhile, Connery was already well-versed in karate. Having been awarded an honorary third-degree black belt while preparing for 1967's You Only Live Twice. Connery explained what went down when the pair worked together in an interview on Jay Leno's Tonight Show in 1996. And then I got a little cocky because I thought I knew what I was doing because, you know, the principle is it's defense, so it's a pyramid, and I got a bit flash and I did that, and he broke my wrist. Wow. And, uh, Martial arts master, lousy fighter? I have something in my pocket right now that will completely clear up that bruise on your forehead. Well, Bruce. Oh. That Bruce. There's no denying that Steven Seagal is an accomplished martial artist. He's a legit seventh Dan in Aikido, a martial art that relies on joint locks and the redirection of momentum. He was even the first American to teach Aikido in Japan. But more than a few fighters think that Aikido is actually kind of worthless when it comes to self-defense. Fight analyst Jack Slack says Aikido only works if your opponent is running straight at you, something most smart fighters never actually do. UFC commentator and fighting fan Joe Rogan adds that Aikido would never work against a trained fighter, never, not in a million years. Mafia Target Steven Seagal has battled all sorts of bad guys on the silver screen, from terrorists to the Yakuza. But Seagal has also faced some scary villains in real life, namely the Mafia. According to a New York Times story from 2002, Seagal was once brought before a Gambino crime family captain named Anthony Sonny Ciccone. The mob boss ordered him to start working with producer Julius Arnasso, with whom he'd had a successful working relationship in the 90s before the two had a falling out. Seagal was so freaked out that he gave the gangsters over half a million bucks. The scandal came to light in 2003, and Nasso was sentenced to one year in federal prison. Seagal's insane raid if you couldn't tell from his filmography, Steven Seagal is fascinated with law enforcement. Well, with the exception of Under Siege. Are you, you like some special forces guy or something? No, I'm just a cook. A cook? Anyway, Seagal actually served as a cop in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana for about 20 years. Then in 2009, Seagal took things to the next level by starring in a reality show called Steven Seagal Lawman. In the third season, Seagal teamed up with the controversial Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County in Arizona, 
In 2011, Arpaio orchestrated a raid against Jesus Yovera, a local man suspected of cockfighting. But when the cops showed up, they had a lot more than just a warrant. There were up to 40 SWAT officers, a bomb squad, canine units, and even armored vehicles. We hope to take the suspect and anybody else who was inside the house by surprise. And what could be more surprising than the police tanks that tore down the gates to Yovera's property? Or the damage done to parts of his house during the raid? This peacock had no idea what to expect. Yovara eventually pled guilty to cockfighting, and the 115 roosters that he kept at his house were saved, right? Wrong. Apparently, the police actually euthanized them all. So that's something. Sweet moves, Steven. With a career as varied as Steven Seagal's, it's important to remember that he's not just about punching, kicking, and killing lots of chickens. This dude also plays the guitar in a blues band. And sometimes he does, well, whatever this is. Raunchy and irreverent, Richard Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong captured the spirit of the 70s counterculture with an authenticity that couldn't be denied. Keep watching to discover the untold truth of this iconic duo. Richard Anthony Cheech Marin was born on July 13, 1946 in South Central Los Angeles. His father Oscar was an officer with the LAPD while his mother Elsa worked as a secretary. He received the nickname Cheech from an uncle who joked that baby Richard looked like a fried pork rind, chicharron in Spanish. While still a child, Marin moved with his parents to the suburb of Granada Hills where he attended a Catholic high school. He had musical aspirations and performed in bands with his friends. He was a straight-A student, but he also had a reputation as a class clown, which frequently landed him in hot water. After high school, Marin attended California State University at Northridge, where he tried marijuana for the first time. Upon taking his first puff, the formerly straight-laced Marin was transformed. Dismissing the propaganda that adults had fed him about the drug, he mused, What else have they been lying to me about? Marin also became active in the anti-war and draft resistance movements while in college. With draft resistors being imprisoned, he escaped to Canada with the help of his pottery teacher. He then worked as an apprentice to a famous potter and settled down to rustic life in a secluded log cabin in the Canadian wilderness. Thomas Chong was born on May 24, 1938, to Dad Stanley, a Chinese immigrant who worked as a truck driver, and Mom, Lorna Jean, a Canadian waitress. He grew up in Calgary, Alberta, as the product of an interracial marriage, learning hard lessons about racism from an early age. In a 2020 interview with The Guardian, he opened up about his childhood in his conservative hometown. While recalling his exclusion from a friend's birthday party, he noted, I just looked out of the window of the second story and could see my friends gathering around the fire. I was uninvited because the girl's father was worried she might end up with a colored guy or Chinese guy. At the age of 16, Chong dropped out of high school to pursue a career in music. A talented guitarist, he landed a gig with The Shades, a multiracial soul group out of Calgary. Changing their name to Little Daddy and The Bachelors, the band moved to Vancouver, where they released a single and built a small following. They would reach their pinnacle when they became known as Bobby Taylor and The Vancouvers. Recommended to Barry Gordy by Diana Ross and The Supremes, the band signed with Motown and recorded the top 40 hit Does Your Mama Know About Me. Co-written by Chong and Bobby Taylor, the touching ballad about an interracial couple peaked at number 29 on the Billboard Hot 100 and made it to the top 5 on the R&B charts. Chong was ultimately fired from his band, so he pocketed a $5,000 severance check and made his way back to Vancouver. While on the road, his parents had converted one of the night spots he owned into the Shanghai Junk, Vancouver's first topless club. During his time with Bobby Taylor in the Vancouver's, Chong had been exposed to the comedy of Chicago's Second City. He found renewed purpose in improv, and the Shanghai Junk was the perfect venue to hone his chops. Recruiting four topless dancers, a mime, and a classical guitarist, he was going to reinvent burlesque for the hippie generation. Meanwhile, Cheech had migrated to Vancouver and found work as a part-time writer for a local music magazine. His editor suggested that he meet Chong. The unconventional pair hit it off, and Cheech was brought on as a writer. The duo's famous act came about by accident when Chong and his new music group were scheduled to play their first show. To warm up the crowd beforehand, Cheech and Chong came out to tell some jokes. The audience was doubled over with laughter as one hilarious bit led into another. 
The act ultimately went on so long that there was no time for the band to play. We always approached uh, uh, comedy as music. Had a certain rhythm to it, you know, had a certain beat. You knew when to come in, when to not come in. An energized Cheech and Chong eventually headed for the comedy capital of the world, Los Angeles. They landed a gig at an open mic night, but they struggled financially and were forced to move in with Chong's estranged wife, making for a living situation that quickly became untenable. Circumstances became especially dire when dwindling profits forced Chong's Vancouver nightclubs to close. Slowly, Cheech and Chong began performing regular gigs at several Southern California clubs. After one disastrous show, they decided that they just weren't connecting with their audience. They then mined the peace, love, and dope ethos of the era for material to develop their Pedro and Man characters. The audience response was immediate. The lovable stoners were comedy gold, which led to sold-out shows, better venues, and a deal to make their first comedy record when music producer Lou Adler caught their act. With $2,000, a tape recorder, and a rehearsal space at A&M Records, Cheech and Chong crafted a comedy masterpiece that showcased their wit, razor-sharp timing, and brilliant characterizations. Released in August 1971, their self-titled debut album connected with critics and audiences alike, eventually peaking at number 28 on the Billboard charts and earning the duo what would be the first of six Grammy nominations for Best Comedy Recording. In 1978, Cheech and Chong set their sights on conquering Hollywood with their first feature film, Up in Smoke. Although they originally conceived the movie as a compilation of the best bits from their albums and live shows, they ultimately decided to concentrate on their Pedro and Man characters. As Cheech explains to Rolling Stone in 2018, it was a day in the life of Pedro and Man, which was more interesting than a plot. It's two guys meet, they decide to form a band together, but first they need a joint. Therein lies your plot. With no formal script, Up in Smoke was largely improvised. With Lou Adler at the helm, Cheech and Chong had free reign to experiment. Nonetheless, the movie faced its share of obstacles on its journey to the screen. Upon seeing a rough cut of the film, then Paramount president Michael Eisner pulled the plug on the picture. Adler bought the film back from the studio, using his own money to complete it. After witnessing a test audience's reaction, Eisner relented and Paramount bought the film back. Budgeted at just under $2 million, Up in Smoke wound up making $20 million in its first month of release. Cheech and Chong followed Up in Smoke with Cheech and Chong's next movie in 1980 and Nice Dreams in 1981. Sticking to their patented drug humor, the new movies failed to live up to the high standards set by the first film, but they were still filled with classic moments and turned a tidy profit against their relatively low budgets. The duo's next film, 1982's Things Are Tough All Over, featured Cheech and Chong temporarily putting down their giant spliffs for a more story-oriented comedy. The following year, they returned with Still Smokin', a loose collection of sketches and concert footage that finds the stoners in Amsterdam for a film festival. Critics weren't kind, though fans stood by the duo and their body juvenile humor. However, their next project, a radical departure from their tried-and-true formula, left even the most loyal Cheech and Chong devotees wondering what the pair were smoking. Cheech and Chong's The Corsican Brothers, released in 1984, cast the comedy legends in a spoof of Alexandre Dumas' classic story of brothers who can feel each other's physical pain. Reviews were generally dismissive, and audiences took a pass as well. Failing to make back even half of its $10 million budget, The Corsican Brothers would be Cheech and Chong's final feature. In 1985, Cheech and Chong released the album and home video Get Out of My Room. It would be their final release before an acrimonious split. After nearly two decades, ego and creative differences had soured their friendship. Although they'd soldiered on through their differences, never allowing their animosity toward each other to affect their working relationship, tensions between the two eventually became unbearable. During a conversation with Talks at Google in 2017, Cheech noted, there was always a contentious conversation between Tommy and I because we were very strong personalities, but it was the irritant that produced the pearl. He also insisted that the cause of the breakup came down to Chong's inflated ego. As we went along and got more success, Tommy wanted to be everything. He wanted to be the director and the sole writer. And Chong's refusal to participate in the recording of the song Born in East LA was the final straw for Marin. Decades later, a humbler Tommy Chong agrees with his partner's assessment of their breakup. During a radio appearance in 2020, he admitted, I was really, really hurt, although it was probably my fault why we broke up, you know? I got to be a bit of a megalomaniac when it came to the movies because I ended up directing them. Once you become a director, your word's God, and it's hard to lose that. When he first went on his own, I, I, I felt like really... Um Betrayed. The song Born in East L.A., a parody of Bruce Springsteen's Born in the U.S.A., was credited to both Cheech and Chong, even though it was actually by Cheech on his own. 
It was a huge hit, which led to Universal executive Frank Price suggesting to Cheech that the story of a hapless Mexican-American man's misadventures after being mistakenly deported would make for a great comedy feature. Cheech jumped at the opportunity as he wrote, directed, and starred in his first major project without Tommy Chung. Released in 1987, Born in East L.A. established Cheech as a creative force on his own. With a knack for creating characters through accents and dialects, the newly liberated Cheech became an in-demand voice actor, as he would go on to show up in the likes of Oliver and & Company and The Lion King. He also got the chance to show off a subtler side of his comedic skills in the 1996 rom-com Tin Cup. By the late 90s, Cheech had put the drug-addled comedy of his past mostly behind him. A new generation of fans would come to know him not as the perennially wasted Pedro, but as San Francisco special investigator Joe Dominguez on the CBS cop show Nash Bridges. He also became a familiar face in director Robert Rodriguez's action movies and kids' comedies. In 2012, Tommy Chung let the public in on his health struggles by announcing that he'd been diagnosed with prostate cancer. A longtime advocate for marijuana legalization and the medical use of cannabis, he turned to the plant as part of his treatment. But now that I found out that, that the, uh, the hemp oil will help the prostate, hey, I'm back, man. Less than a year later, Chung announced that with a combination of hash oil and dietary supplements, he had, quote, kicked cancer's ass. Unfortunately, he would face another health setback in 2015 when he announced that although his prostate cancer was in remission, he was now under treatment for rectal cancer. In typical Chong style, he took the news with optimism and humor. He told Us Weekly, I'm using cannabis like crazy now, more so than ever before. I'm in treatment now, either I get healed or I don't, but either way, I'm going to make sure I get a little edge off or put up. A Cheech and Chong reunion has been in the works since 2003, with the iconic comedy duo planning a new movie. But when Chong served a prison sentence for drug paraphernalia charges that year, it derailed their big screen plans. But eventually, to the delight of their legions of fans, the duo finally reteamed for a 2008 nationwide comedy tour. On stage together for the first time in 25 years, Cheech and Chong found that the old magic was as vibrant as ever. As Cheech told NPR, When we came back last year to start doing this, we didn't really even rehearse. We just kind of talked over what we were going to do and then went on stage and did it. It was like we've been apart 25 seconds, not 25 years. Over a decade into their reunion, the pair continue to pack theaters for their sold-out live shows. Even though Cheech is now in his 70s and Chong is in his 80s, they're still smoking in the 21st century. Everyone has their favorite Christopher Walken moments. Whether it's the monologue from Pulp Fiction, the devastating end of The Deer Hunter, or that epic video for Fatboy Slim's weapon of choice. He's such a distinctive character in his own right, it's almost as if he's made a career out of playing himself. But is he? Here's the untold truth of Christopher Walken. I tell you this because as an artist, I think you'll understand. Performer or actor? You know how actors like Daniel Day-Lewis immerse themselves in a role, staying in character even off screen for as long as the movie takes to make? Christopher Walken is exactly the opposite. When it comes to preparing for a role, all Walken does is memorize his lines, his least favorite part of the job. His approach to acting is simple. He says, no matter what character I'm playing, it's me. I'm the only person in my life that I can refer to. Just a little something to keep in mind the next time you see him on screen playing a sadistic avenging angel or a resurrected horseman from hell. He's unambitious. Guardian reporter Emma Brox once described Walken as so aggressively modest it made him seemingly immune to criticism. And she was definitely onto something. Walken isn't self-important. If someone doesn't want him for a part, the actor doesn't get offended. And if he goes for a while without working, he doesn't panic. Actually, he embraces it. If, if I'm not working, I, I don't leave the house. Ultimately, Walken credits his long career in show business and his lack of an ulcer to not trying too hard. He describes himself as lazy, and when it comes to his work ethic, he says, I don't chase stuff. His secret identity. Even Walken's superfans might be surprised by these little-known facts. For one, he's the star of the best tap-dancing striptease ever caught on camera. And for two, Walken's real name isn't actually Christopher. It's Ronald, after old-school British actor Ronald Coleman. Christopher, on the other hand, is the name randomly bestowed upon him by Belgian star Monique Van Voren when he was working as a backup dancer in her cabaret. She'd try out different names on me, and one night she said, I'm gonna call you Christopher, and I said, you know, fine. Uh, don't, don't call me late to lunch. Uh -huh. Walken liked Christopher enough to keep using it professionally. His friends and family, however, still call him Ronnie. A Hollywood Tragedy 
In 1981, actress Natalie Wood drowned while sailing off the California coast, and Christopher Walken found himself unexpectedly tangled up in one of the most sensational and mysterious accidents in Hollywood history. Walken and Wood had been filming a movie together at the time, and he was on the yacht that night along with her husband, Robert Wagner, enjoying what some witnesses described as quite a rowdy party. The devastating accident is a tragedy Walken has been trying to put behind him ever since. In 1986, he responded to a reporter's questions about Wood by saying that it was, quite simply, a conversation I won't have. He really talks like that. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow, indeed. Ask anyone to do an impression of Christopher Walken, and they'll imitate the actor's well-known habit of arbitrarily emphasizing random words and pausing in odd places. But that's not just an on-screen affection, it's actually how he talks. Walken attributes his unusual speaking style to growing up in a Queens neighborhood where English was everyone's second language, saying, it's a rhythm thing. People who speak English where they have to hesitate and think of the right word, and I think it rubbed off. Walken also changes his scripts to suit his speech patterns, removing punctuation and swapping periods for question marks. But despite being one of the most mimicked actors in Hollywood, he still doesn't recognize his voice when it's coming out of someone else's mouth. So don't bother trying to wow him with your Christopher Walken impression. When people do that, I, I never know what they're doing. Stolen Wardrobe In 2010, Walken showed up in an interview with The Independent, sporting a jacket he'd worn on screen 20 years earlier in The Comfort of Strangers. And when someone asked about it, he freely admitted that not only did he lift the jacket from the set, but it wasn't a one-time thing. He said, I never buy clothes. Whenever I do a movie, all my clothing is from that movie set. They don't give me anything. I steal. Apparently, Walken's reputation for petty theft preceded him on at least one movie set. When he was in Batman Returns, the clothing department cleared out his dressing room while he was filming his last scene, which which means he didn't get to take home a single statement bow tie from his turn as the evil, yet dapper, Max Shrek. Unusual Fears Despite playing many characters who might be right at home in your nightmares, Walken has plenty of fears of his own, including driving, flying, airports in general, and horses? Yep, it's true. As far as Christopher Walken is concerned, the scariest thing in this horrifying scene from Sleepy Hollow isn't the headless rider, but the horse, which was actually a mechanical animal augmented with CGI in the few scenes where Walken had to appear on horseback. He hates parts written just for him. If nothing confuses Christopher Walken more than a Christopher Walken impression, then nothing annoys him more than seeing one in a script. In an interview with Rolling Stone, the actor admitted that he hates when writers revise a script with him in mind, a process he calls Walkenizing. As a result, the actor turns down a lot of roles that he feels are deliberately weird, although that still leaves plenty of room for wholesome, organic weirdness like this. Did you ever take a picture of your nose? The real-life story of Wesley Snipes, whose movie career ranges from raucous comedy to superhero action to serious drama, is a complicated one, with plenty of comedy, action, and drama of its own, along with some tragedy, too. In 2010, Snipes was sentenced to three years in prison for tax evasion. According to the Papas Group, self-proclaimed tax advisor Eddie Ray Khan told Snipes and around 4,000 other unlucky advisees to set up non-profit religious corporations, name themselves as overseers, channel all their earnings into those nonprofits, and live tax-free because of tax exemptions for religious organizations. Khan also printed so-called bills of exchange for his clients, which were documents that looked like checks but weren't actually checks. Khan would send the bills of exchange to the IRS in lieu of payment, thinking that would appease them. It didn't. Snipes set up his fake religious nonprofit and then sent the IRS an amended return in which he claimed a $7.4 million refund on his 1997 taxes. The IRS didn't agree with that assessment, clearly. It's possible Snipes simply got really bad advice, but the fact remains that he took it. I relied on the, the advice of those who I considered professionals. Wesley Snipes' reputation as a tough guy has probably contributed to a persistent rumor about his relationship with actress Halle Berry. In a 1996 interview with People magazine, Barry said a boyfriend once hit her hard enough to puncture her left eardrum, resulting in an 80% hearing loss in that ear. You lost 80% of your hearing in your left ear, is that mm -hmm. true? Mm -hmm. Was he famous? <laughs> that means yes. According to people who knew her at the time, her breakup with Snipes caused her a lot of personal distress. Barry has never come right out and said Snipes was the ex who hit her, but her former boyfriend, R&B singer Christopher Williams, pointed the finger at Wesley Snipes after vehemently denying that he himself was responsible. Two of her other exes were similarly accusatory. 
Former Major League Baseball star David Justice even went so far as to publicly deny that he was the abuser in a tweet, saying, Reading the latest Halle Berry reports, it wasn't me who hit Halle causing the ear damage. Halle has never said that I hit her. In follow-up tweets, Justice added the initials WS, which seems to point the finger at a specific ex of Berry's. Snipes was born in Orlando, Florida, but he grew up in the Bronx, where he discovered his love of acting. According to GQ, Snipes attended the School of Performing Arts in New York starting at the age of 13, but was only there for a couple of years before his mother announced that they were moving back to Florida. On his last day living in New York, Snipes got a phone call from a well-known New York theater producer, inviting him to take part in an upcoming musical as his stuff was literally being loaded into the U-Haul. When he got back to Florida, Snipes learned that the movie Fame was being shot at the School of Performing Arts, and a lot of his former classmates were in it. A lot of kids would have given up in despair at that point, but not Snipes. After he was voted most talented by his high school graduating class in 1980, he went on to the State University of New York where he obtained a fine arts degree. It wasn't until 1986, though, that he finally got his big break. A casting agent helped him get a role in the football movie Wildcats. Some action stars really are trained fighters, and Wesley Snipes can count himself in that category. In fact, if you lined up all of Hollywood's action heroes based on real action hero skills, Snipes would be somewhere near the front of the line. Snipes started his martial arts training when he was 12, and he didn't just stick with the same style. He studied several Asian martial arts as well as Egyptian, Brazilian, Indonesian, and African styles. According to Bleacher Report, he has a fifth-degree black belt in Shotokan Karate. But it's still not enough to take down Mike Tyson. According to a story in the book The Inner Ring by Tyson's former bodyguard Rudy Gonzalez, the former heavyweight boxing champion caught Snipes with Tyson's then-girlfriend at a soul food restaurant in Los Angeles, ordered Snipes to the restroom, and then knocked him out cold. Not long after landing his first movie role, Snipes got a lucrative part in a music video, and not just any music video. It was a starring role in Michael Jackson's epic video for Bad, which was directed by the legendary Martin Scorsese. Also, he stole the part from Prince. At least, that's what he told Conan in 2017. So actually, Michael had told Prince that he had the role, and, and then he met me. Is that true? It's, this is a true story. For the record, that's not the way Prince said it happened. Snipes plays the antagonist in the video, but that wasn't his only job on set. According to Rolling Stone, he was also Jackson's bodyguard while they were filming in Harlem. Jackson was evidently feeling less than comfortable in that environment, and at one point he turned to Snipes and said, Are you scared? Snipes later recalled, I was like, Yo, Mike, what are you talking about? This is Harlem, baby. This is where we grew up. They love you. Really? You're scared? He was like, A little. Snipes reportedly once led police on a 120 mile per hour chase down Florida's turnpike in 1994. According to the Palm Beach Post, a dispatcher informed the Martin County Sheriff's Office that there was a motorcyclist going over 100 miles per hour on the turnpike. Officers responded, and the motorcyclist led them on a 30-mile, three-county chase that ended when he crashed into a grassy area on a turnpike exit. It was Wesley Snipes, of course, and officers also say that during the chase, he tossed something about the size of a baseball off the side of the road. Police later found three ounces of marijuana wrapped in tape, though they couldn't conclusively prove it belonged to Snipes. Snipes was briefly handcuffed and charged with reckless driving. His defense was he didn't know he was being chased, and the crash at the exit was just the normal, ordinary sort of crashing one might expect when exiting the turnpike at 130 miles per hour. Snipes was hit with a $7,150 bill for court costs and was sentenced to 80 hours of community service. Wesley Snipes was raised Christian, but at a young age, he started to have some doubts. According to Ebony Magazine, he was one of just four black students in the theater arts department at his university, a fact that he said made him feel, quote, like mold on white bread. Then he found out about Malcolm X, and everything changed. He said, When I saw a Malcolm X documentary, it changed my whole life. Everything. I went straight to the library and literally stole the autobiography of Malcolm X, and for two days, I just read. Snipes found himself drawn to Islam and its emphasis on black pride, and for a while he was a Muslim. His new religion didn't stick, though, and today he no longer calls himself a Muslim. He explained, When you're drowning, you grab onto a log to keep afloat. But don't hold on to the log when the boat comes by. Get on the boat and bring your butt on back home. So Islam to me was the log to make me more conscious of what African people have accomplished, of my self-worth, to give me some self-dignity. White Men Can't Jump was the unlikely buddy film where Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes scammed their way through pickup basketball games, but it wasn't their only screen outing. 
Snipes and Harrelson first teamed up in Wildcats before going on to star together in White Men Can't Jump and Money Train. Over the years, the two have formed an obvious bond, some might even say bromance, to the point where Harrelson once went out of his way to stick up for his friend. According to The Smoking Gun, Harrelson wrote a character reference letter to help Snipes during the sentencing phase of his tax evasion trial. In the letter, Harrelson called Snipes, quote, a true citizen of the world who strives for rightness in all his relations. In an interview with BET, Harrelson also said that he would choose Wesley Snipes as his Hunger Games killing partner. He is a fifth-degree black belt, so it's not a bad choice. Like many Hollywood actors, Wesley Snipes spends time on both coasts. In 2001, he had an apartment in Manhattan. That's where he and his wife Nikki planned to be during September of that year, but plans changed when Nikki gave birth to their daughter. The September 11th attacks destroyed the Snipes' apartment, so who knows what would have happened if they had been home at the time. Wesley Snipes told The Guide, My daughter was born at the same time as the attacks. We were taking care of her in Los Angeles because there's a tradition that you don't travel with a newborn. So, literally, we were lying in bed and my sister called me and said, Turn on the TV. Our daughter's lying there between us and I looked over at my lady and said, Baby, our place is gone. I just turned to my daughter and started kissing her. That's why you came, my girl. You saved our lives. You're a lifesaver. Wesley Snipes has a reputation for being, well, difficult. There's no better illustration of that than Patton Oswalt's first-hand account of what Snipes was like on the set of Blade Trinity. And he wouldn't come out of his trailer, and you'd walk by his trailer, and this wall of, of pot stench would just be like, whoa! Snipes was apparently often high on set or just not there at all, and Oswalt told the AV club everyone else had to compensate. A lot of the lines that Ryan Reynolds has were just a result of Wesley not being there. We would all just think of things for him to say and then cut to Wesley's face not doing anything because that's all we could get from him. Oswald also said Snipes tried to strangle director David Goyer over another actor's attire, and the day after Goyer jokingly tried to hire a bunch of bikers to pretend to be his security, Snipes sat down with him and said, I think you need to quit. You're detrimental to this movie. Unfazed, Goyer replied, Why don't you quit? We've got all your close-ups and we could shoot the rest with your stand-in. Snipes reportedly backed down, and then for the rest of the production refused to communicate with Goyer except via sticky notes, which he would sign, From Blade. Black Panther was one of the first movies to feature a black superhero supported by a mostly black cast. And it was a long time coming. Longer than you think, even, because in the 1990s, none other than Wesley Snipes had plans to bring the franchise to the big screen. Snipes even told The Hollywood Reporter that the legendary Stan Lee was on board with the project. Evidently, one of the major roadblocks to the production was that Snipes had trouble explaining the difference between the comic book Black Panther and the 1960s civil rights group, the Black Panthers. Snipes recalled, They think you want to come out with a black beret and clothing, and then there's a movie. After three scripts, producers were ready to sign a director, but when Snipes discussed the project with potential director John Singleton, Singleton insisted that they put the Black Panther character in the civil rights movement, so there was that problem again. Ultimately, the project stalled out because Snipes couldn't find the right combination of director and script, and also because he didn't feel he could do justice to the high-tech world of Wakanda given the special effects limitations of the time. Snipes went on from there to do Blade, and we got an extra awesome version of Black Panther a couple decades later. Clark Gable is regarded as one of the most handsome actors in Hollywood history, but there was one thing about him that his romantic co-stars just couldn't stand. Keep watching to discover all the secrets of this silver screen legend. Clark Gable truly came from humble beginnings. He was born on February 1, 1901 in Cadiz, Ohio, to his father William Henry, an oil driller and farmer, and his mother Adeline. Addie, as she was known, suffered from some form of sickness for the majority of her life, and when she became pregnant with Clark, doctors advised her that giving birth would be fatal. Nevertheless, she proceeded to give birth in their duplex clapboard house, and she paid $10 for a doctor to come in while also receiving help from a downstairs neighbor. While it's not exactly clear what sort of sickness plagued Addie, the doctor who delivered Clark believed that she was suffering from a progressive brain tumor. Sadly, she had a mere 10 months with her baby boy before her untimely death at the age of 31. After Addie's passing, Clark was shipped off to his aunt and uncle from his mother's side while his father looked for a new home and bride. When William remarried in 1903, the future star moved back in with his father and new stepmother. As a teenager, Clark Gable was involved in technical jobs, as he worked at a tire factory in Ohio after dropping out of school at age 16. The job made sense, as he enjoyed fixing cars in his youth. But that's not to say he was only a tradesman, as he blended his love for technical work with intellectual pursuits as well, including reciting Shakespeare for his friends. And when he was 13, he was the town's youngest band member. 
Surprisingly enough, Gable's most influential moments came while he was employed at the tire factory. He just so happened to see a production of the play The Bird of Paradise and loved it so much that he suddenly knew what his long-term profession would be. Bird is the word. Clark Gable's rise to fame was an interesting one, mainly because of the connections he forged. In 1924, when he was 23, he moved to Hollywood to pursue his dreams. His resume wasn't much to speak of at that point, as he'd only acted in a few Oregon-based theatrical productions. Thankfully, Gable had his biggest fan by his side, his wife Josephine Dillon, who was 18 years his senior. They originally met in Oregon, where she was working as a theater manager. In a sort of My Fair Lady scenario, or My Fair Gentleman in this case, Dylan used her money to fix Gable's unflattering teeth and hairstyle, while also lowering his speaking register and helping him with his body language. When he was finally ready, they headed to Los Angeles. Dylan also acted as her husband's manager, as she managed to land him a few bit parts while also using her connections to snag him a role on Broadway in 1928. His star only rose on the stage, although it came at the cost of his marriage. He left Dylan for the incredibly wealthy Rhea Langham, who became his second wife in 1931. His star power then continued to rise thanks to Langham's high society connections in New York. The likes of Cary Grant, Gregory Peck, and Errol Flynn were all considered conventionally handsome. But Clark Gable, on the other hand, was a manufactured Tinseltown star, who changed his appearance at the behest of his first two wives. But alas, not everyone fell for Gable's facade. MGM studio head Louis B. Mayer once told the budding star that he was too elephant-eared and unattractive to reign as a silver screen icon. So in the early 1930s, Gable was stuck playing minor roles as thugs or villains, though his female fans responded with rave reviews. Eventually, MGM realized Gable's potential profitability and began to groom him to become a leading man by styling his hair and eyebrows, giving him dentures, and forcing him to go to the gym. As biographer E.J. Fleming put it to Ozzy, Gable was a complete studio creation. Clark Gable commanded the camera's attention with his rugged good looks and nonchalant persona, but what was he like when the camera stopped rolling? As it turns out, he was reportedly a notorious womanizer. Perhaps one of the most shocking stories about him was the one shared by fellow old Hollywood icon Loretta Young in her memoir. Gable and Young crossed paths as co-stars in the 1935 film Call of the Wild, where they began flirting instantly. Once production wrapped on location and the cast and crew boarded a train and headed back to Hollywood, Young recalled Gable entering her compartment, where he allegedly raped her, resulting in a pregnancy. At the time, Gable was married to Rhea Langman, and Young didn't tell a soul what had happened until years after the incident, as she instead hid her pregnancy for as long as she could. She eventually gave birth to a girl named Judy and shipped her off to be raised by nuns, until she cleverly took her back two years later and disguised the entire ordeal as a mere adoption. It wasn't until I was 31 that I finally did ask my mother and did hear the truth from her. But by that time, my father had died. Clark Gable was exactly the ideal sort of masculine hunk that the golden age of Hollywood required out of its leading men. But that doesn't mean that he had the rugged, musky scent that you might associate with that image. As detailed in Warren G. Harris's Clark Gable, a biography, while the future star was still a young boy, his stepmother, Jeannie, instilled in him a love of cleanliness, while also dressing him in fine clothing and ensuring that he was perfectly groomed. One female fan even once observed of Gable, he was so clean you could eat off him. This acute obsession with hygiene lasted into Gable's adult life, which screenwriter John Mahan observed when he served in the army with Gable during World War II. As he recalled in Clark Gable, a biography, he shaved his chest and armpits, and he said, yeah, can't stand hair. Gable was also repulsed at the thought of Mahan taking a bath, opting instead for showers so that he wouldn't sit in dirty bathwater. Weirdly enough, even though Gable was hypersensitive to hygiene, his co-stars didn't enjoy kissing him, as he was reportedly known for his bad breath due to his dentures. His Gone with the Wind co-star Vivian Lee even reportedly made a stink about their particularly passionate on-screen moments. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Clark Gable was married five times over the course of his life, but no woman truly captured his heart as much as his third wife, Carol Lombard. The two of them met in 1932 on the set of the movie No Man of Her Own. Lombard was a married woman at the time, but she nevertheless felt sparks flying between herself and her co-star, although no moves were made immediately. By 1936, Gable and Lombard ran into each other again and promptly started dating before eloping three years later. Sadly, their marital bliss was cut short with the onset of World War II. In January 1942, the Treasury Department for the Victory Committee decided to bring the state of Indiana into America's national campaign of war bond sales. Lombard was born in Indiana, so she was sent to Indianapolis to help with the campaign. 
When it came time to head home, the Treasury Department didn't allow for commercial flying, but Lombard nevertheless decided to take a plane back to Burbank, California. Tragically, though, it never arrived, with everyone on board dying when it crashed into a mountain. By August 1942, a heartbroken Gable joined the Army Air Force, reportedly telling his former publicist's widow, I'm going in and I don't expect to come back. Ever since then, there's been speculation about the idea that Gable may have wanted to die while serving in the war. After the death of Carol Lombard in 1942, Gable joined the Army Air Force during World War II with guns blazing. As Robert Matson, author of Mission, Jimmy Stewart and the Fight for Europe, explained to Den of Geek, Carol Lombard wanted him to go fight and she's killed. So he then decides, all right, I'll go fight and hopefully I'll be killed too. That's why he wanted to be in the 8th Air Force, because he wanted to die in a plane crash. In addition to that supposed death wish, there was another fear looming on the horizon, Adolf Hitler. The German dictator was a huge fan of Gables and even reportedly considered him his favorite American actor. It's also been contended that Hitler had bootlegged a theater copy of Gone with the Wind before it was even released in the United Kingdom. Furthermore, Hitler considered Gable to be a highly valuable war criminal among the Allied forces, and he even offered up some generous incentive for any soldier that could deliver the actor to him alive. Gable was reportedly acutely aware of this terrifying reality, and he once even declared to a friend, If Hitler catches me, the son of a b will put me in a cage like a gorilla and send me on a tour of Germany. If a plane that I'm in ever gets hit, I'm not bailing out. Nobody knows it better than the sucker who started it, little Adolf. Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe were two of the biggest stars during the golden age of Hollywood, both international icons in their own right. They didn't cross paths on screen too often, though, as they only starred in one movie together, 1961's The Misfits. Interestingly enough, that film proved to be the final finished product for both stars before their untimely deaths. There's no better place to be. You couldn't find better company either. All right. Gable never even had a chance to see The Misfits on the big screen, having suffered a fatal heart attack two days after filming it wrapped. Monroe, meanwhile, began shooting Something's Got to Give alongside Dean Martin in 1962, but that project was ultimately shelved after she died of a drug overdose that same year. While many consider Gable's role in The Misfits to be one of his greatest performances, it turns out that shooting the Western was anything but easy. At the time, Monroe was going through a breakup with the movie's screenwriter Arthur Miller, while also fighting an alcohol addiction and various psychological issues. With all that going on, filming would be delayed on days that she appeared late or didn't show up altogether. After Gable's death, Moreau's condition only spiraled further. She reportedly felt immense guilt for how she acted while on set, believing she may have contributed to her co-star's demise. Kay Gable, Clark's widow, extended an olive branch to Monroe after the birth of their son John Clark as she invited Monroe to his christening, which he attended. By the time the 1960s rolled around, Clark Gable had starred in an impressive 82 films, having begun his on-screen acting journey back in the early 20s. As the New York Times put it in their obituary, he was the undisputed king of Hollywood for over two decades and had such a powerful box office draw that some movie theaters would simply announce on their marquees, this week, Clark Gable. It was in November 1960 when a tragedy occurred as Gable was hospitalized for a heart attack. As the Los Angeles Times reported, he was rushed to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital, where doctors believed he would make it out alive, noting he was doing fine. Sadly, though, he died November 16, 10 days after being admitted. Gable remained humble about his success until the very end. As the New York Times noted, even when he was bringing in $7,500 a week, he had reminders littered throughout his dressing room, citing his lower-class upbringing. On some of them, he wrote the simple but powerful message, just to remind you, Gable. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE. 4673. From cameos to grindhouse leads, Danny Trejo is one of the most recognizable faces in Hollywood. However, his life story and personal factoids also make him one of the most interesting actors to ever grace our screens. That being said, let's explore some of his untold truths. Danny Trejo has a pretty incredible rags to riches story. According to Grantland, the future action star grew up in the rough neighborhood of Pacoima in Los Angeles. Though he was raised by his parents, his most significant influence came from his uncle, Gilbert, who was six years older than him. He became his, quote, mentor of crime, teaching him the ins and outs of burglary while also introducing him to drugs and alcohol. He was eight when he tried marijuana for the first time and 12 when he first experienced heroin. Trejo said during an interview on Wide Open with Tony Gonzalez, it was basically a ghetto. 
Ironically enough, although Gilbert was an awful influence on the young boy, he also taught him how to survive, something that would come in handy during Treo's countless stints in prisons across California. At 13, Gilbert began using Treo as, quote, his punching bag, and as the star told Grantland, I had to learn to fight or get my head beat in. Thanks to Trejo's upbringing, he was only 12 or 13 years old when he landed in Juvenile Hall for the first time, noting that he kept landing in the slammer for, quote, everything, be it common law robbery or assault. Trejo explained that it was merely the way of life. As HuffPost details, from here, Trejo transitioned into more serious crimes, such as robbing liquor stores with live grenades and getting involved in shootouts. Of course, spending time with his uncle Gilbert didn't exactly help the situation. Trejo recalled on the Lip TV, he was like the cool one. He was the one that always had the big wad of cash. According to Trejo, Gilbert also thankfully, quote, taught me everything that would come in handy in prison, and Trejo definitely had the chance to sharpen his skills. The actor said in an interview with Tony Gonzalez, I've been in every prison in the state of California. In fact, according to Texas Monthly, Trejo was in and out of prisons for more than half of his life by the time the late 60s rolled around. Probably one of the most important things Trejo learned from his uncle Gilbert was how to fight. According to Grantland, the Machete star even grew up learning how to spar alongside Benny the Jet Urquidez, a future world champion kickboxer. As Urquidez recalled to the outlet, Danny never backed down. He was a natural. He had a big heart and a strong jaw. Sure enough, that strong jaw survived countless brawls in the California prison system. Trejo told TMZ Sports, I was a lightweight and welterweight champion in every penitentiary I was in, and I was in all of them. He got a bit more personal on Wide Open with Tony Gonzalez, explaining further, That was my goal. That's as far as it went. After spending time in many of California's jails in the 1960s, what happened next for Trejo would change everything. As he explained to The Guardian, the actor took part in the 1968 Cinco de Mayo riots at San Quentin State Prison, one of the most dangerous penitentiaries in the world. After the riot ended, he was transferred to Soledad Prison and placed in solitary confinement. He said in the interview, they said I threw a rock and hit a lieutenant in the head. He did admit to throwing a rock, but according to him, he was aiming at someone else. He spoke of his experience in extreme solitude and how it completely changed his attitude towards life. It all culminated to being in the hole in Soledad, looking at a wall that somebody smeared and wrote God sucks in human feces, and I'm butt naked, like this is me, that moment of clarity. After getting out of the hole, Trejo began going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in prison, eventually completing the program. He told LA Weekly, without AA and NA, I wouldn't be here. Just like without God, I wouldn't be here. After making parole, he found work as a drug counselor at Western Pacific Rehab, which snowballed into an opportunity that Trejo himself didn't even expect. As the actor recalled to The Guardian in 1985, one of his clients phoned him in distress, explaining they needed Trejo to come to their place of work due to a large amount of cocaine being passed around. After giving Trejo an address in the warehouse district, he recalled thinking to himself, we'll sit out in his car at break, smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, and afterwards, he would go back inside. However, when Trejo arrived, he found out he was on a film set for Andre Konchalovsky's Runaway Train. What happened next was sheer luck. Trejo was asked if he could, quote, act like a convict. And once the future star took his shirt off, the screenwriter recognized his iconic tattoos. As it turned out, both men spent time in San Quentin State Prison. Because of their connection, Trejo found himself hired to train actor Eric Roberts how to box. As the action star told The Guardian, I'd rather be paid to be the bad guy. All in all, he was paid $320 a day. Despite the narrative of his early life, Trejo has managed to stay sober ever since his epiphany in prison. As he explains in his documentary, Inmate Number no. 1, The Rise of Danny Trejo, I made a promise to myself to start trying to do good. As he told The Hollywood Reporter, everybody asks me, how do you stay so young? I consider myself 48 years old. That's when my life started. According to Variety, in May 2021, Trejo was honored by the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center CryHelp in Los Angeles, having been sober for nearly 53 years. He told the outlet that his life has been, quote, like a dream since getting sober and getting out of jail. He emphasized, I've got nothing to complain about. I've got nothing to fix. And since I'm a Mexican, I can do whatever I want. Not only has Trejo created a much better life for himself since his release from prison, but he's also made it his life mission to help other people and pay things forward. He told LMNT Online, 
everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. And there's no doubt that it's exactly what Trejo has been doing. The actor has taken part in the documentary Survivor's Guide to Prison, revisiting the same jails where he was once incarcerated to talk about the dangers of crime life to those currently serving time. Most importantly, however, he's dedicated his spare time to working as a drug counselor for at-risk teens. As he revealed to The Guardian, even now, kids come up and say, Trejo, what's up? You helped me years ago. So that's been a blessing. As if his work mentoring convicts and kids with substance abuse problems isn't enough, Trejo goes out of his way to help random people whenever the chance arises. According to the Washington Post, Trejo was driving in Los Angeles when he witnessed a car accident, resulting in an overturned SUV. There were three people in the vehicle, a woman, a special needs child, and the woman's mother. As he ran to help the woman, who was stuck behind the driver's door, he then realized the woman's mother and her son were unable to escape the back seat. According to Trejo, the boy was panicking, and as he smelled gasoline, the action star knew he had to act fast. With the help of another bystander, he was able to get the boy out of the vehicle. Then, he did his best to distract him from the mayhem while newly arrived firemen worked to free the grandmother. I'm holding him like this, and I'm, I started talking about, wait a minute, we gotta use our superpowers. And so he goes, superpowers. <laughs> Who knows how the scenario would have played out if Trejo and the other bystander had not been there to help. Despite his real life kindness, Danny Trejo is notorious for playing intimidating bad guys on the big screen. In his documentary, Inmate Number no. 1, The Rise of Danny Trejo, Trejo says that for the first five years of his career, he was merely playing bit parts as quote, Inmate Number no. 1, Cholo Number no. 1, and Essay Number no. 1. Regardless, his star power only grew, and he became much more recognizable as time went on. It helps that Trejo has some pretty distinguishable tattoos too, especially his chest piece. In fact, as he told Prison Legal News, International Tattoo Magazine says it's the most recognizable tattoo in the world. In 2014, he gave a bit more insight about his piece while on The Howard Stern Show, telling the shock jock that he got the quote, Mexican lady with a sombrero done by Harry Super Jew Ross while in prison. In a truly crazy tattoo origin story, Ross did Trejo's tattoo over time in three different jails, having followed the future actor whenever he got transferred to another prison. Although Ross would go on to become exceptionally famous in the tattoo community, Trejo's piece was his first, and he wasn't exactly a fan of his own work. As Trejo quipped to showbiz cheat sheet, he would be like, don't show that. But I was like, just shut up. This tattoo made you famous. Danny Trejo has seriously been in a lot of movies. As of the making of this video, the actor has over 400 credits to his name, and he's showing no signs of slowing down. So out of all of those roles, does he have a favorite? He told Prison Legal News, probably Machete. The eponymous character of the Robert Rodriguez flick actually has an origin story from another one of the director's movies, Spy Kids. Per MTV, Machete was the uncle of the two lead kids, always helping to save the day. Yet it was a fake trailer from Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino's Grindhouse double feature that really catapulted the suddenly violent character into the mainstream. With the audience reception of the bogus trailer being so positive, Rodriguez eventually gave Machete his own movie in 2010. Although they've worked together on a number of different films, it turns out that Rodriguez and Trejo aren't just buddies. They're family too, as Rodriguez is Trejo's second cousin. Trejo told MTV, I didn't realize it until we were on the set of Desperado. My family came down in Texas to visit me on the set, and we found out we were second cousins. I was like, all right, cuz. Trejo truly loves kids. Along with his work counseling at-risk teens, he's also got five of his own children, Gilbert, Daniel, Esmeralda, Danny Boy, and Jose. He told Variety, my kids are my greatest accomplishment. I just adore them. Ultimately, his kids are what keep him motivated to stay in Hollywood. As he told Texas Monthly, he views acting as, quote, just a job, one that helps him provide for his kids. And it looks like the acting bug has caught on with his offspring too. According to the outlet, Gilbert directed his father in 2020's From a Son, a tale of a father searching for his drug-addicted boy. Unfortunately, the story hits uncomfortably close to home as Gilbert himself suffered through his own real-life substance abuse problems. Commenting on his role in the film, Trejo said, It's the biggest thing I've ever done. Overall, it seems that family life suits Trejo, a far cry from his chaotic and crime-filled past. When Grantland's Amos Barshad went to visit the star for an interview, he described Trejo's neighborhood as, quote, quiet and unassuming, while his home was a modest California ranch. Besides acting and his family, Trejo's other passion is food. 
publishing his cookbook, Trejo's Tacos, Recipes and Stories from L.A. in 2020, the actor told the Hallmark Channel that it was his mother who inspired him to pursue a culinary side hustle. He said, My mom was an amazing cook. In addition to this inspiration, he explained that he wanted to try a new spin on Mexican food in an effort to help people eat healthier. The Latino community has admitted that we have a problem with obesity. After publishing his cookbook, he took his love for food a step further by opening up his first restaurant, Trejo's Tacos, in 2016, which has now grown into a franchise of nine restaurants. This was followed by Trejo's Coffee and Donuts, a bright pink bakery with Trejo's signature scowling mug as its logo. As Trejo told Wide Open with Tony Gonzalez, he even has a locale at an airport, which he jokingly says, quote, kind of makes you legit. Few people have had the kind of social impact that Bruce Lee did. Just about everyone knows who he was and what he did. But there are plenty of aspects of his life that the public may not actually know. Here's a look at the untold truth of Bruce Lee. Master of None it's said that Lee only ever lost one fight when he was 14 years old. He had no training at that point, but the experience spurred his need to learn to defend himself. This eventually brought him under the influence and tutelage of Yup Man in 1957, who taught Lee the Wing Chun style of martial arts. The pairing has become the stuff of cinematic legend, with several films made about their meeting. However, before Lee completed his training, he moved to the United States, ending his formal training in Wing Chun. Though Lee would go on to become a world-renowned martial artist, he never actually became a master of any single form, including Wing Chun. He invented his own style. After leaving Hong Kong, Lee began to teach his own form of martial arts. He initially based his style on what he learned of Wing Chun, but called his form Jun Fan Gong Fu, which translates into Bruce Lee's Kung Fu. Lee opened his first martial arts studio in Seattle and continued to develop his style until he created Jeet Kune Do in 1967. Jeet Kune Do evolved after Lee's legendary fight with Wong Jack Man in 1974. The fight supposedly lasted for several minutes, leading Lee to conclude that the form of Kung Fu he was following was too formalistic to be practical. This led to the evolution of Jeet Kune Do, a system of fighting that abandons the rigidity of established forms and places an emphasis on practicality, flexibility, efficiency, speed, and physical fitness. Lee's influences in establishing his new style came from fencing, western-style boxing, and Wing Chun. Jeet Kune Do is still practiced thanks to Lee's influence and teachings. Some notable practitioners include Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lady Gaga, and Nicolas Cage, among many others. He was a child actor. It's hard to find someone who doesn't know Bruce Lee and his work like Enter the Dragon, but most people aren't aware of his prolific body of work prior to becoming a worldwide celebrity. Bruce Lee was acting since he was a little kid. He even worked on a film at the tender age of three months. In the 1941 film Golden Gate Girl, he played a Chinese baby, which was a role he was literally born to play. He didn't do much more until the age of six, but by his 18th birthday, he had performed in 20 films. One Inch Punch Remember that scene in Kill Bill Volume 2 when Uma Thurman is buried alive and has to one-inch punch her way out of her coffin? Most people watching something like that would probably dismiss it as an impossibility or a gimmick, but it was based off of something Bruce Lee often did in performances. According to biomechanical researcher Jessica Rose of Stanford University, when watching the one-inch punch, you can see that his leading and trailing legs straighten with a rapid, explosive knee extension. This forces the speed of his twisting hips to increase, which lurches his shoulder forward. He was literally putting his entire body, and likely most of his resting energy, into each punch. Lee would instantly pull his fist back, which shortened the impact time. This compressed the force and made the punch all the more powerful. Poet and Philosopher You may not think of Bruce Lee as a poet or philosopher, but he studied both poetry and philosophy in school, and was published several times. While attending the University of Washington, he focused his studies on Asian and Western philosophy, incorporating elements of Buddhism and Taoism into both his poetry and his martial arts. This helped him to better understand himself, and how he and his martial arts were more of a method of self-expression of his philosophy than anything else. I said, empty your mind be formless, shapeless, like water. And water can flow, or it can crash. 
the water my friend. He also read throughout his life and maintained a rather impressive library in his home, with more than 2,500 books focusing primarily on martial arts and philosophy. Shortly before his death, Lee wrote a personal essay called In My Own Process, where he reflected on his role in the world. Basically, I have always been a martial artist by choice and actor by profession, but above all, I am hoping to actualize myself to be an artist of life along the way. The Fab Five some may remember him from his role as Kato on The Green Hornet, but most people recognize Bruce Lee as the leading man in films like Enter the Dragon and Fist of Fury. When he died at the age of 32, though, Lee had only acted in five major American productions. Marlowe, where he only had a minor supporting role, The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, The Way of the Dragon, and Enter the Dragon, which was released after he died. Just as his martial arts skills were often too fast to be captured on film, the same could be said about his entire life. Deadly allergic reaction. Bruce Lee's death was a tragic accident nobody could have predicted. It wasn't from a fight or injury, but rather an allergic reaction to a painkiller that caused his brain to swell. Fans had a hard time believing that something so random and mundane could bring down their hero, and rumors immediately began swirling that he had actually been murdered. But though his death was officially ruled death by misadventure, that terminology was misleading, and the coroner's report was conclusive. It was cerebral edema that killed him. Bruce Ploitation. Shortly after Lee died, filmmakers in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan began hiring anyone who looked anything like Lee and put them in crappy martial arts films, hoping to bank on the deceased star's popularity, look, and style. Not only did the studios hire men who looked like Lee, these guys ended up changing their names to sound something like him as well. Bruce Lai, Bruce Lau, Dragon Lee, Bruce Leong, and Bruce Le were prolific throughout the 70s, and most of the movies were pretty awful. About the only good thing that can be said is that they provided an opportunity for the next generation of martial arts movie stars, like Jackie Chan, who briefly worked with Lee before his death, even faking an injury in order to get sympathy hugs from his idol. But then suddenly, I don't know why, I just pretend very painful. Oh, 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 I just want Bruce Lee hold me as long as, as, long as uh, he can. Some rare gems did shine through during the Bruce Ploitation era, though, including Game of Death which used footage that Lee himself had filmed before his death. The film was an instant classic, reminding everyone that there will always be just one Bruce Lee. Ginger Rogers was married five times and divorced five times, but were any of those marriages broken up by her partnership with Fred Astaire? Keep watching to find out. Ginger Rogers' fame had an early start and was possible all thanks to the dance craze of the 1920s, the Charleston. In 1925, the 14-year-old Rogers, then known by her birth name Virginia McMath, won a dance competition and was crowned Charleston Champion of Texas. When I won this contest, what kind of contest? A Charleston contest. The prize for winning the competition was a vaudeville contract. With the help of her mother, Ginger Rogers and her redheads was born. Ginger was a nickname which came about when a cousin couldn't pronounce her given name of Virginia, while Rogers was the last name of her stepfather. She played vaudeville stages until 1929, eventually making her way to New York City. From there, a star was born. Dancing was sometimes painful, particularly alongside Fred Astaire, who was a notorious perfectionist. While filming Swing Time, Rogers coped with extreme foot pain. She wrote in her autobiography that she kept dancing even though her feet really hurt. At one point, she removed her shoes and they were filled with blood. I had danced my feet raw, she explained. Producers recommended they stop filming, but Rogers wanted to complete the scene. They finally got what they wanted by 4 a.m. Astaire had a lot of confidence in his dancing partner. He once remarked that the other women he worked with over the years often cried because they didn't think they could make it through the routines. Rogers was the exception. According to the book Texas Entertainers, Lone Stars and Profile, Astaire said, quote, no, Ginger never cried. Astaire, on the other hand, may have had to hold back some tears during the filming of the 1936 film Follow the Fleet. Ginger Rogers wore a stunning beaded gown that weighed over 25 pounds. The sleeves were also covered in heavy beads and had a tendency to hit Astaire in the face. Rogers admitted she was, quote, completely unaware that her gown was causing Astaire so many problems. He winced and was forced to physically move out of the way while she kept on dancing. Rogers, of course, became an icon by dancing with Astaire. Ironically, when they first met on a dance floor, she didn't know who he was. I was from Texas. I had never heard of Fred Astaire. And so it didn't mean anything to me. 
That's why I guess I had such fun. In addition to dancing, Ginger Rogers also had some impressive acting abilities. In 1940, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her role in Kitty Foyle. Over the next few years, she devoted much of her time to polishing her comedy routines and working for the war effort. Like many celebrities of the time, she was prominently involved in the United States Service Organization and participated in rallies to help sell war bonds. In her book, Ginger, My Story, she said, quote, We were all proud to do our part. All of Rogers' hard work and popularity paid off, as it resulted in the actress becoming the top-paid star in Hollywood in 1945. Her earnings were around $300,000, and she was the eighth-highest moneymaker in America that year. Rogers was also career-savvy. Willing to change with the time, she transitioned to television in the 1950s. She appeared in several comedies, dramas, and variety shows, which were popular at the time. And she later returned to the stage, appearing in Hello, Dolly! in 1965 and Mame in 1969, among others. Ginger Rogers famously dated celebrities such as Howard Hughes and Jimmy Stewart, but she was unlucky in love. She tied the knot five times, but none of them stuck. She was just 17 years old when she married her first husband, vaudeville dancer and comedian Jack Pepper. They split after two years together. She married her second husband, Lou Ayers, in 1934, but they divorced six years later. She also married actor Jack Briggs from 1943 to 1949, French actor Jacques Bergerac from 1953 to 1957, and actor-producer William Marshall from 1961 to 1969. Despite persistent rumors, however, it's unclear whether she was romantically involved with dancing partner Fred Astaire. Either way, Rogers wrote in her autobiography, Yes, I have had some failed marriages, but I always loved being married. Caring, cooking, and being a companion with a husband were as natural to me as breathing. Despite all her relationships, Rogers never had children. Her personal assistant of nearly 20 years, Roberta Olden, told Fox News that one of the reasons why Rogers didn't have children was because she was so busy with her career. Olden also speculated that Rogers simply didn't find the right man to have children with. And while other women gave up certain things to have kids, Olden explained that Rogers enjoyed her career, so she focused on that instead. In 1936, Ginger Rogers became one of the first people to be named an admiral by the Texas Navy. What's the Texas Navy, you ask? Well, in the 19th century, it was a literal navy for the Independent Republic of Texas. A century later, it had basically become a historical organization with ceremonial titles, kind of like the Kentucky Colonels. It was Texas Governor James Allred who made Rogers an admiral in the Texas Navy during the opening of the Texas State Fairground in Dallas. Rogers later wrote in Ginger My Story, I never knew Texas had a navy. Salute me, y'all. Ginger Rogers had her share of fashion moments over the years. She lived during a time long before social media influencers persuaded fans how to dress. However, she told the New York Times that when she wore a blue feather dress in the 1935 film Top Hat, feather sales skyrocketed. This cemented her status as a movie-style icon. Then, her 1940 film Kitty Foyle made white-collar dresses a hot commodity. She wrote in her autobiography, I can never emphasize enough how important clothing was to me. That was one of the reasons why she decided to partner with J.C. Penney in the 1970s serving as a fashion consultant from 1972 to 1975. Rogers handpicked clothes for the mail order catalog and traveled around the states to help women find affordable but fashionable clothing options. The star developed a wardrobe for hundreds of stores in America. According to her book, she had a particular interest in lingerie. It was a big get for the department store because it had secured one of America's most popular Golden Age stars as their spokesperson. J.C. Penney executives chose Rogers as a representative due to her fashion knowledge and because they believed her famous gams would help the company sell pantyhose. The partnership made perfect sense because as a dancer, Rogers had kept her legs in top shape. Some celebrity watchers may be surprised to learn that Ginger Rogers not only played tennis but was a formidable opponent. In fact, she was such a good player that in 1950, the 39-year-old actress competed at the U.S. Open in a mixed doubles match with tennis player and actor Frank Shields who today is most well-known for being actress Brooke Shields' grandfather. At the time, Rogers was still a popular film star and had recently appeared with Fred Astaire and the Barclays of Broadway, so it may have seemed odd that she was competing at a professional sporting event. There was reportedly some consternation over her participation due to her celebrity status. Even so, she was a skilled player who was good enough to qualify for the event. Her former assistant, Roberta Olden, told Fox News that Rogers was a very good tennis player. She initially played the sport alongside Hollywood legends such as Errol Flynn and Katharine Hepburn, but she was looking for a challenge, and she certainly got it at the tournament. Unfortunately, she and Shields lost to a much younger team. Rogers also competed in a celebrity tournament that took place in conjunction with the U.S. Open, but she and her partner lost before the final match. Around 1940, Ginger Rogers purchased a ranch in southern Oregon. 
According to her longtime assistant, Roberta Olden, she loved the ranch because it was the perfect place to relax, and it was likely a good retreat from Hollywood. She spent her time there cooking, fishing, horseback riding, reading, and skeet shooting. Olden told Fox News, she would let her hair down, wear no makeup, and just be a regular person. She loved that, too. It's very easy for me to go up to my ranch and, and can fruit. The ranch was more than just a home for Rogers and her mother, who also resided there. Her ranch provided some support during the war effort as well. Its Guernsey cows produced milk for local army men at Camp White, which was home to approximately 25,000 soldiers during World War II. Rogers was even featured on the cover of Life magazine in 1942, with the article inside offering a glimpse of her life there. She and her mother lived at the ranch for over half a century before the star sold the property in 1990 and moved to nearby Medford, Oregon. Ginger Rogers' mother raised her as a Christian scientist, and the religion was a huge part of her life. One of the ways in which she practiced her faith was by living a clean life without alcohol and avoiding the temptations that Hollywood had to offer. Her religion and relationship with God were part of her life both on screen and off. Roger's longtime assistant, Roberta Olden, told Crosswalk.com that her faith was very important and that she knew that it was God's gift of goodness that shone through her performances. However, it wasn't always easy for Rogers to avoid the pressures of the industry. Privacy was difficult to attain because she was so famous, and not everyone understood her Christian beliefs. Plus, she endured several failed marriages and had other struggles that could have caused some people to quit Hollywood. Instead, she took refuge in her church and through prayer. Olden explained, I don't think there was a day that went by when she didn't thank God for something. Due to her beliefs as a Christian scientist, Ginger Rogers was one of those rare celebrities who neither smoked nor drank alcohol. She loved hosting parties but served cold non-alcoholic drinks. Her favorite was ginger ale, and one of her favorite indulgences was ice cream sodas. So it's somewhat ironic that over the years she's had at least two different alcoholic beverages named after her. Of course, as one of America's most iconic movie stars, she's in good company as there are drinks named after many other stars of Hollywood's golden age, including Shirley Temple, Charlie Chaplin, and Mary Pickford. The Ginger Rogers is simple to concoct and a pleasant summertime cocktail. Unsurprisingly, the ingredients include gin, ginger, and ginger ale, which not only pay homage to the star's famous name, but to her personal preferences as well. There's also a different version you can get at Disneyland of all places, though it too has gin as its base ingredient. Ginger Rogers was born in Northern Independence, Missouri, a town that in recent years had made an effort to commemorate her achievements. But it wasn't always that way, and the star felt that she deserved some recognition. President Harry Truman, who spent decades living in Independence, planned a special event there for Rogers in 1964 after she complained that the residents celebrated his birthday but didn't commemorate hers. She was also honored at an event in town in 1994. The actress, who passed away in 1995, likely would have been pleased that in 2018 her former home, a registered historic landmark, was officially turned into a museum. Rogers and her mother lived on the property for four years, and the home was restored so it looked like it did when they resided there. The property also became the site of the Ginger Festival that year, which celebrated the life of the Hollywood icon. The money raised during the festival was allocated toward repairing the home's roof and upgrading the landscaping. The festival included the presentation of two Ginger Rogers films, a fan club meeting, and a presentation about the house. Unfortunately, the museum closed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Which famous sci-fi franchise wouldn't exist without Lucille Ball? Which episode of I Love Lucy made television history? And who was Ball's real soulmate? Keep watching for some crazy cool facts about this talented and beautiful Hollywood icon. Desiree Ball gave birth to Lucille Ball on August 6, 1911, in Jamestown, New York. Lucille's father, Henry, was an electrician. Shortly after Lucille was born, the family moved to Montana so Henry could find work according to biography. Then they relocated to Michigan for a job at the Michigan Bell Company. In 1915, Lucille's father got typhoid fever and passed away. Lucille was not even four years old. Some of Lucille's earliest memories took place during that time period. After her father's death, the family moved back to Jamestown, and her mother married a man named Ed Peterson, who didn't like children and didn't want to live with them. As a result, Peterson and Desiree moved to Detroit, while Lucille moved in with her stepfather's parents, and her brother lived with his maternal grandparents. Lucille's life was threadbare as the Petersons couldn't even afford to pay for pencils for school. Most people remember Lucille Ball as a gregarious, outgoing personality, at least in the roles she played on television. 
but Lucille wasn't an extrovert when she was just starting out in the business. I know you're not shy. Yeah, that's it. I, I just found out I, I'm very shy. She moved back in with her mother at age 11 and by 15 persuaded Desiree Ball to permit her to apply to a New York City drama school. Lucille said of the experience, I was a tongue-tied teenager spellbound by the school's star pupil, Betty Davis. Davis, of course, became one of film's most notable stars. School administrators eventually told Lucille's mother her daughter was, quote, wasting her time and hours. This did not deter Lucille, and instead of giving up her acting dreams, she stayed in the Big Apple. Lucille got modeling gigs in the late 1920s for fashion designer Hattie Carnegie and Chesterfield Cigarettes. She then set her sights on Hollywood, landing a role in Stage Door with Katharine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers. Lucille Ball is synonymous with red hair, but she didn't always have ginger locks. She was a natural brunette and even had blonde hair before hairstylist Sidney Gilderoff made the ingenious move to turn the actress into a redhead, according to Yahoo. And no, Ball didn't wear a wig. However, it was a challenge to maintain her hairstyle. According to one of her stylists, Irma Coosley, Ball's hair was actually golden apricot, not red. Coosley explained, I used regular hair dye to color it and then a henna rinse which she was famous for. She had a safe of the henna in my garage. Ball discovered the best way to keep her red hair in tip-top condition while spending time in Las Vegas, where she met a wealthy man who offered to send her a large box of henna to make the process easier. Lucille Ball and her husband Desi Arnaz created Desi Lu Studios, which, during the late 1950s, was the top television production company. From producing Ball's namesake show, I Love Lucy, to other classics like Mission Impossible, The Andy Griffith Show, and The Dick Van Dyke Show, Desi Lu Studios had a penchant for choosing projects that challenged cultural and societal norms. It also incorporated the latest technology in its programming. Ball bought Arnez's interest in the production company in 1962, which made her the first female to lead a major Hollywood studio. She was able to channel her talent into the company during the 1960s when media was evolving. She also set the stage for today's women in entertainment. Ball was a pioneer when she took over Desilu Studios, and today's Hollywood stars can credit her for blazing the trail. Lucille Ball appeared in several films in her younger years, but her comedic skills didn't really make an impression until she landed a radio job. The program, My Favorite Husband, was broadcast on CBS Radio. Ball believed the radio show could be converted into a television program, but not everyone was on board. So she and her husband, Desi, created an act they took on the road. Arnez played with his band while Ball acted out comedy routines. Their act became a hit, and it resulted in the series I Love Lucy. What people may not realize is that Ball was 40 years old when the show first aired. Today, few TV programs are centered on women of that age, and during the 1950s, it was unheard of. However, Ball's talent and vibrant on-screen persona made up for the fact that she was older than her contemporaries, and for Ball to achieve such success with her work later in life was groundbreaking. If you've ever seen an episode of I Love Lucy, you probably laughed at some point. Lucille Ball was a riot in episodes like Job Switching, when she and her friend Ethel worked in a chocolate factory. It's hard to keep a straight face watching the pair stuff chocolate into their mouths and clothes when the conveyor belt goes faster and faster. The Vitamita Vegemin episode was also hilarious, as Lucy got drunk tasting a health tonic for a commercial. Interestingly, Ball didn't think she was funny. She said as much to Rolling Stone in 1983, explaining, My writers were funny, my directors were funny. The situations were funny. What I am is brave. I have never been scared. Not when I did movies, certainly not when I was a model, and not when I did I Love Lucy. While she didn't give her comedic skills much credit, Ball was funny, especially in episodes such as Lucy's Italian Movie, in which she stomped grapes and got into a fight while doing so. You may be surprised to learn that in 1936, Lucille Ball registered to vote as a member of the Communist Party. 
Despite her political leanings, it did not affect her career. Rena Vale, a former screenwriter and investigator for the House on american Activities Committee, or HUAC, testified that a Communist Party meeting was hosted at the star's home in 1937. Ball was not present at the meeting and claimed she didn't participate in any activities related to the party. However, the FBI determined that she was a delegate for the party's state committee and took part in party-related radio broadcasts in 1940. When pressed about her involvement with the Communist Party, Ball and her husband Desi Arnaz claimed she registered only to please her socialist-leaning grandfather. Arnaz also passionately defended his wife, proclaiming she wasn't and never would be a communist. Fortunately for her career, Ball was not blacklisted like so many others in Hollywood were at the time, largely because she was such a beloved actress. Lucille Ball was interested in buying a series so Desilu Studios would have a show to call its own. While several TV programs were filmed by her company, it didn't own most of them. So when producer Herb Solo approached Ball with the sci-fi series Star Trek, she saw an opportunity. Since Ball and Desi Arnaz created the process of syndication or reruns, she had the foresight to see that the same concept would work well with Star Trek The Original Series. As inverse details, while the original Star Trek only aired for three seasons, it truly shined in reruns. Ball had nothing to do with the creative aspects of Star Trek, but she was instrumental in providing its financial backing. TV execs rejected the pilot episode, but Ball was so confident in the show that she paid for a revamped pilot. I don't believe it. This type of thing did not happen in 1965 and rarely occurs today. Star Trek The Next Generation actor Gates McFadden narrated the documentary The Center Seat and stated, without the bravery and determination of Lucille Ball, who defined Hollywood and expectations, well, Star Trek probably wouldn't exist at all. Celebrity friendships can be fascinating, including the one between Lucille Ball and Betty White, who is known for her roles on The Golden Girls and The Mary Tyler Moore Show. The women met in the late 1950s and instantly fostered a strong connection, with their friendship lasting over 30 years. The pair both worked on radio and television and even owned production companies, a rarity during that era. White talked to The Atlantic about her pal and noted that the redhead was always trying to teach her backgammon. It never quite worked out because Ball wasn't the best teacher. Still, the pair played the game frequently and it was a lot of fun, according to White. But that's just a small reason why the twosome remained friends for so many years. Anne Dusenberry, who appeared on Super Password with White and Life with Lucy with Ball told Closer, their bond was their common accomplishment as businesswomen in a male-dominated industry. Ball's former co-star Keith Thibodeau, who played Little Ricky on I Love Lucy, claimed the pair were so close because Ball admired White's, quote, fighting spirit. In the early 1950s, the idea of seeing a pregnancy on television was unfathomable. But that all changed with the December 8, 1952 airing of the I Love Lucy episode Lucy is Enceinte on CBS. Lucy has become a Hollywood legend. Me, a Hollywood legend. In the episode, Lucy and Ricky learned they were going to be parents. For the first time in history, a pregnant woman was portrayed on television, a groundbreaking moment for Lucille Ball. However, the word pregnant was never uttered during the episode because it was considered vulgar. At the time, the episode was a bit shocking because of its subject matter, but it paid off in the long run. When Little Ricky was born during an episode on January 19, 1953, 44 million viewers watched. To put that in perspective, the number one show of the first week of December 2021 was NFL Sunday Night Football with 18.5 million viewers. Another way in which Ball broke TV boundaries was by insisting her Cuban immigrant husband Desi play her on-screen husband in I Love Lucy. According to the Television Academy, 
TV execs feared viewers wouldn't believe a white woman would have such a close relationship with a Hispanic man. But Ball threatened to walk if Arnez wasn't included. Arnez helped audiences accept his character because he was an excellent comedian and poked fun at himself. Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz divorced after nearly two decades together, but the pair reportedly remained soulmates the rest of their lives, according to sources. They had two children, but split up in 1960 due to Arnaz's alcoholism and womanizing ways, reports The Guardian. Author and playwright Lee Tannen was friends with Ball and told the publication, the day Desi died was the day she started dying. It was such a love affair that unquestionably she loved him until the day she died. And I believe he loved her. The Queen of Tuesday, a Lucille Ball story author, Darren Strauss, told CBS News that Ball and Arnez were a perfect couple who loved each other very much, but they couldn't live together. He believes Arnez was unequivocally the love of Ball's life. When Lucille Ball first set her sights on Hollywood, she appeared in several films with heavy hitter co-stars like Henry Fonda, Judy Garland, and Ginger Rogers. Early on in her career, she appeared in quick succession in films such as Roman Scandals, Blood Money, and Kid Millions. She gradually landed larger roles, including 1950's Fancy Pants, alongside Bob Hope. She starred in more than 80 films during her career. While she was making I Love Lucy, she even appeared with husband Desi Arnaz in a few comedies, such as 1954's The Long, Long Trailer. After Ball divorced Arnaz in 1960, she returned to the small screen with The Lucy Show, which aired from 1962 to 1968, and followed it up with Here's Lucy, which aired from 1968 to 1974. Her last TV program, Life with Lucy, was unfortunately a failure and only stayed on air for two months in 1986. Neither critics nor viewers liked the show, and it was Ball's last role before she died at the age of 77. Fortunately, Ball's legacy is connected to her most beloved sitcom, I Love Lucy, one of TV's most iconic shows of all time. Hanging with a killer? Sleeping in cow manure? Throwing himself off a roof? These are just a few details about the notoriously private Robert Redford. Robert Redford was born to a middle-class family in Santa Monica, California. His father worked as a milkman and, later, an oil company accountant, while his mother was a homemaker. She shared her love of films and books with her son, while also teaching him how to draw. She believed in me, and uh, she was always very supportive, more than any family member. Sadly, Redford's time with his mother was cut short. In 1954, a year after he graduated from high school, she died from septicemia. Years later, during a chat with NPR, the actor noted that his family didn't deal well with loss. He explained, I come from a dark family that emigrated from Ireland and Scotland. Didn't talk much. You don't complain much. You bear the brunt of whatever comes your way, and you do it with grace. This attitude toward death wasn't due to his mother's untimely passing. Years earlier, Martha Redford gave birth to twin girls who died shortly thereafter. Robert remembered it as yet another instance where tragedy simply wasn't discussed. It's hard to imagine that a charming, confident movie star like Robert Redford once struggled to fit in, but Redford's experience growing up was anything but easy. According to Robert Redford, the biography by Michael Feeney Callan, a local gang called the Pachucks once harassed him, leading to a scary incident on a rooftop. The gang dared him to jump from the roof to prove he was a man. Redford did so, and nearly died in the process. The moment led to a revelation that Redford shared with his biographer. You have two choices, it seemed to me. You can be led by your fears, or you can overcome them. Soon, the tables turned. Redford and some school friends started their own gang, the Barons, which was essentially a front for various illegal activities such as theft and breaking and entering. Success didn't come easy for Robert Redford. Speaking to Success Magazine in 1980, Redford confessed that, in high school, he repeatedly got fired by his employers, noting that he failed at everything. Thankfully, Redford was gifted with natural athletic ability. After high school, he went to the University of Colorado on a baseball scholarship. Not one to abide by the rules or hit the books, however, Redford dropped out after a year. He decided to move to Europe in hopes of becoming an artist. Redford first went to Paris, where he credits his time in the French capital for sparking an interest in cultural and political affairs. After France, 
Redford moved to Italy, where he hitchhiked around the country and painted in the streets to make money. Clearly, Redford wasn't flourishing. He confessed to his biographer that he once slept in cow manure as a means to stay warm. In 1958, Redford sold all his artwork for $200, enough to return home to America. He shared with Success Magazine that, the experience gave me a kind of nervousness, which was good. When Robert Redford returned home from Europe, a friend observed his affinity for the theater and told him to get some acting experience by attending New York's American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Redford did just that. But after leaving the conservatory, making a living remained challenging. By this time, he'd married historian Lola Van Wagenen, and the couple were living on his wife's bank job of $55 a week. When Van Wagenen got pregnant, she had to stop working. Unfortunately, the pair had nothing in their savings account. After being rejected for countless parts, Redford finally got lucky in 1959 when he landed a role in a Broadway comedy called Tall Story. He had only one line, but the budding star got paid $82 a week. Redford recalled his audition as a mess, playing with a basketball and acting crazy until the director finally agreed to hire him on the condition he stop acting immediately, and the rest, as they say, was history. Robert Redford's love for the wilderness dates back to his youth when his mother took him to Navajo reservations in Arizona and Yosemite. His love for the natural world has continued to inspire Redford throughout his life. If anybody ever asks me why you don't live in Beverly Hills, now I'll be able to tell them. In the 1950s, while riding a motorcycle from California to Colorado, Redford discovered Provo Canyon, stunned by the beauty of Utah's Mount Tipanogos. The actor declared that he'd soon return and build a home nearby. True to his word, Redford and his new wife returned to Utah and bought two acres for $500. That land would become part of Redford's Sundance compound and, later, the Sundance Mountain Resort. As his career began to take off, Redford bought more land. In an interview with Architectural Digest, Redford described this time as, do another TV show, buy another acre. By the late 60s, developers had begun efforts to disrupt Utah's natural landscape. So Redford and some friends bought thousands of acres, successfully preserving the area. By the late 80s, he added 95 cottages to his resort, later building over 200. In 2020, he finally sold the property, praising the buyers in an interview with Forbes by saying, change is inevitable. They'll ensure that future generations can continue to find solace and inspiration here. The Sundance Institute, which houses the annual Sundance Film Festival, was founded by Robert Redford at his resort. In 1978, Redford attended the now-defunct United States Film Festival in Salt Lake City, where he and a handful of other people watched an indie flick. The actor recalled the time, the director has something special to say. I wished there was a way to help them. By 1984, Redford had founded the Sundance Institute, and he held its first film festival a year later. The star explained in an interview with the Walker Art Center, The reason I started Sundance was because I felt that the mainstream was completely controlling exhibition, and I just felt that there were a whole lot of other people out there who were talented, who had stories to be told, but they were undisciplined because they had not had a chance to develop themselves. Sundance has given many major names their first big breaks, including directors Quentin Tarantino, Steven Soderbergh, and Wes Anderson. By the early 1960s, Robert Redford was finding steady work in the film industry as his star power rose. He and his wife were parents to two children, yet something was missing. Redford was at a loss, so he decided to take a solo road trip to clear his head. He parked his car in California's Big Sur and walked for 90 miles. He finally came across Deachin's Big Sur Inn and became fast friends with the hotel's owner, a convicted murderer who spent time in Alcatraz before arriving in Big Sur. The men spoke endlessly over the course of a few days. In his authorized biography, Redford remembers thinking, here's a man who'd come full circle in the journey of life. He'd get plastered and cuss at the world. He was volatile, but he had great wisdom. Those days spent with the innkeeper were just the fix Redford needed to reignite his overall lust for life. It's hard to imagine anyone other than Dustin Hoffman playing panicked, clueless Benjamin Braddock in The Graduate, but the 1967 classic almost had a completely different actor as its star. The film's director, Mike Nichols, had directed Robert Redford on Broadway in Barefoot in the Park, and they'd become friends. When Nichols began casting The Graduate, his buddy was keen on the lead role. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Nichols recalled telling Redford, I said, you can't play it. You can never play a loser. When Redford protested, Nichols asked him a simple question. Did he ever get rejected by a woman? Redford was confused. The answer was, obviously, no. Excuse me? Would you mind lending me your wife? 
Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, released in 1969, is the movie that made Robert Redford a household name. In an interview with the Salt Lake City Tribune, he recalled, when I read the script, I thought, this is perfect for me. It had a lot to do with my own sensibility, which has always been kind of an outlaw sensibility since I was a kid. Redford was still relatively unknown in Hollywood, and director George Roy Hill wanted someone else for the role. But Paul Newman respected Redford as a fellow stage actor and pushed for him. On set, the two men quickly discovered shared interests that only grew as time went on. In fact, Redford had so much fun with Newman that he's been quoted as saying that he felt guilty for taking money for his work due to how enjoyable the entire experience was. Thank you, enough dynamite there, Butch. In addition to Redford's iconic portrayal of the Sundance Kid, he's also responsible for the shooting location. Hill intended to film in Spain to save money, but Redford took the director to his stomping grounds in Utah and explained why it was historically and visually important for the film. Being a Tinseltown icon for six decades means Robert Redford has countless famous pals, but he was particularly close to fellow Hollywood legend Natalie Wood. Redford first met the child star at Van Nuys High School, where he was in charge of moderating the entrance of late students into assemblies. One day when Wood was late, Redford wouldn't let her into the auditorium. He didn't have a clue who she was, he explained in an interview with TCM. She begs, but I won't budge. So she storms off. Years later, Redford ran into his former schoolmate again when they co-starred in 1965's Inside Daisy Clover. The two hit it off, in part thanks to a kind gesture made by Redford. The stars had to shoot a scene on a boat off the Santa Monica Pier, and thanks to heavy winds, they got stranded at sea. Wood, who was famously afraid of the water, was visibly upset, so Redford took it upon himself to ease the tension. From that moment, they became lifelong friends until Wood's untimely passing in 1981. Redford shared with TCM that, I'll always be thankful to Natalie for the things that she taught me. In 2016, Robert Redford announced that he'd be retiring from acting after two more films. You know, I can't do this forever. I've been doing it since I was 21. As you move into your 80s, you say, hey, that's enough. His final flick is that David Lowry directed The Old Man and the Gun. Brian Tallarico of RogerEbert.com dubbed it, quote, a love letter to a cinematic legend. The Old Man and the Gun is based on a true story. Redford plays Forrest Tucker, who, at the age of 70, has escaped California's San Quentin State Prison. He immediately goes back to doing what he does best, robbing banks. However, the main thing that separates Tucker from other criminals is that he oozes a sort of gentlemanly charm that even his hostages can't help but fall for. He had a gun. You saw it. Well, he was also sort of a gentleman. In an interview with the HFPA, the actor explained, some of the other outlaws I've played have done what they've done because they were against the law. Tucker isn't against anything. He's just having a good time. He told Variety that he hopes the movie will simply make people smile. You couldn't ask for a more perfect send-off for a Hollywood icon. You'd be hard-pressed to find any celebrity more beloved than Robin Williams. When he passed away, the entire world mourned. There's even a tunnel in San Francisco named in his honor. However, despite being one of the most prominent public figures of the 20th century, Robin Williams was a man of many hidden layers. Shy and Quiet When one remembers Robin Williams, the first thing that comes to mind is his whimsical intensity. But in his early years, Williams was a self-conscious, quiet, driven kid who struggled with self-doubt. Williams reportedly described his childhood self as short, shy, chubby, and lonely. His parents were usually busy, so he spent a lot of time playing by himself. Williams often claimed that he developed a sense of humor as a way to get his mother's attention. According to Williams himself, he also used comedy to connect to other students and to defend himself from bullies. In your face, camel cake! In your rear, cow derriere! Lying, crying, spying, prying, ultra pig! You loot, crude, rude, bag of pre-chewed food, dude! In high school, Williams was a hard-working, straight-A student and was on track to get a degree in political science until his decision to take improv classes took him in a radically different direction. Mime in the City in 1974, photographer Daniel Sorin was walking through Central Park when he came across a pair of unusually intense mimes. Nearly four decades later, Sorin dug up the old photos he'd taken that day and was startled to realize that one of the mimes was actually a young Robin Williams. Early in his acting career, Williams was living in New York City and studying at Juilliard. Though his unbeatable energy earned him the acclaim of his classmates, the school itself wasn't sure what to make of him, according to classmate Christopher Reeve. After a brief career as a mime, Williams decided to fly home to San Francisco. Bartender to Comedian to Star 
Robin Williams was tending bar at Holy City Zoo, a comedy club in San Francisco, when he began doing stand-up himself. He took his act to Los Angeles, where he gained acclaim and began booking minor TV appearances. Williams' big break came when he played an alien named Mork on an episode of Happy Days. All right, now you tell me that uh, men don't kiss women on your planet? Kiss. I don't know what that means. Nice word, has a pleasant ring to it. Kiss, 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 kiss. Mork was supposed to be a one-off character, but Williams' performance earned such great reviews that the character got his own show. Mork and Mindy was a sensation and made Robin Williams a household name. Despite this success, it took time for Williams to find a film role that fit his heartfelt and energetic style. His first films, Popeye and The World According to Garp, didn't make much of an impression. Williams finally found the role he was looking for in 1987 as a military DJ in... Good morning, Vietnam! On top of improvising to his heart's content, Williams was also able to show off his dramatic chops. From there, he starred in classics like Mrs. Doubtfire, The Fisher King, and Dead Poets Society. Say the first thing that pops into your head, even if it's total gibberish. Go on, uh, go on. Uh, a sweaty tooth madman. Good God, boy, there's a poet in you after all. After earning a string of nominations, Williams finally won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for Goodwill Hunting. This might be the one time I'm speechless the genie that almost wasn't. If the role of the big blue genie in Disney's Aladdin seems like it was tailor-made for Williams, that's because it was. According to the LA Times, Disney had Williams in mind from the start, and even synchronized an early test reel with one of Williams' stand-up routines. But first, before we do the play, I'd like to talk about the very serious subject of schizophrenia. No, he doesn't! Shut up! Let him talk! Williams wasn't a fan of Disney's commercialism, so he agreed to take the part only if Disney promised never to use his voice and image for cross-promotional marketing. Unfortunately, Disney broke their word. Williams' performance was so amazing that they couldn't justify not marketing him. Williams was furious, and his feud with Disney lasted for years. Eventually, the feud was resolved when Joe Roth, the head of Disney Studios, apologized for how badly they had treated Williams. Jilted by the Bat Perhaps no one wanted to see Robin Williams snag a role in a Batman movie more than Williams himself. He was actually up for roles in two Batman movies, but lost out to Jack Nicholson in 1989 and then to Jim Carrey in 1995's Batman Forever. Despite the double snub, Williams would have done anything to be in Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, according to his 2010 interview with Empire. Sadly, the closest Williams came was a disproven rumor that he was going to play Dr. Hugo Strange in The Dark Knight Rises. Struggles with Addiction Sadly, it is no secret that Robin Williams fought a lifelong battle with addiction. People reported that his binge drinking and cocaine abuse began during his time on Mork and Mindy. The Peruvian marching powder, the devil's dandruff. It's a nice thing though, cocaine, mm, what a wonderful drug. Anything that makes you paranoid and impotent, give me more of that. In 1982, Williams dropped both substances as two major life events had taken place. His wife was pregnant with their son, and his friend John Belushi had just lost his life to a drug overdose. The Guardian reported that while Williams stayed sober for decades, he started drinking again in 2003. In 2006, he checked himself into rehab, after which he managed to stay sober for the remainder of his life. He went to rehab again in 2014, but that was not because of a relapse, but to maintain his sobriety. So I went to rehab in wine country just to keep my options open. Misdiagnosis it's often been suspected that Robin Williams's heartbreaking suicide was caused by his battle with depression. In the last few months of his life, Williams began exhibiting symptoms that doctors diagnosed as Parkinson's disease. However, Williams had been misdiagnosed. He actually suffered from Lewy body dementia, which was confirmed by his autopsy. Most people think your husband killed himself because he was depressed. No, Lewy body dementia killed Robin. It's what took his life. Williams' wife Susan said that the last year of her husband's life was a painful flurry of medical treatments in an attempt to help him regain brain function. Was he losing his mind? Yes, absolutely. And he was aware of it. There's no known cure for Lewy body dementia. While the rapid onset of the disease led Williams to take his own life, he'll always be remembered fondly as one of the most celebrated and talented performers of his time. Rock Hudson was a matinee idol during the 50s and 60s and appeared in various romantic comedies, several of which included the personable Doris Day as his co-star. He was also secretly gay in a time when homosexuality was taboo. This is the untold truth of Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson's original name was Roy Shearer Jr., and he was born on November 17, 1925, in an apartment in Winnetka, Illinois. His auto mechanic father didn't stick around, and his mother eventually married a man named Wallace Fitzgerald. Roy then took Fitzgerald's last name, graduated from New Trier High School, and joined the Navy during World War II. 
during which he worked as an aircraft mechanic. After he left the military, Roy traveled to California, where he made a living driving trucks. Roy then set his eyes on Hollywood, investing $55 in a new suit and trying to make his presence known to Hollywood executives by spending time around studio lots. Eventually, an agent named Henry Wilson came upon his headshot and was impressed by Fitzgerald's look. At 6'4", Roy was tall, dark, and handsome, all the right ingredients for a celebrity. Unfortunately, Roy's name lacked that star quality that so many actors possessed. Plus, Wilson had successfully turned a man named Arthur Galeen into Tab Hunter, so he knew a thing or two about the importance of a good name. Legend has it that Wilson came up with the name Rock Hudson by borrowing from the Rock of Gibraltar and the Hudson River. Hudson reportedly disliked the moniker, but he eventually came around and even called his production company Gibraltar. According to Mark Griffin, author of the Rock Hudson biography All That Heaven Allows, young Roy Fitzgerald's stepfather physically abused him. One thing he disapproved of was his stepson expressing interest in being an actor. Roy's stepfather was a former Marine and an alcoholic, as Griffin revealed in an interview with NPR. He reportedly took toys away from Roy that he believed were effeminate and tried to squash Roy's dreams of acting. When he got older, Roy Turned Rock was a closeted gay man during an era in which it was taboo for a matinee idol to identify as homosexual. He had to make his relationships with on-screen stars such as Elizabeth Taylor, Lauren Bacall, and Doris Day believable, so he hid who he truly was on the inside. According to Griffin, this behavior stemmed from his childhood. Griffin wrote in his biography of Hudson, Long before he landed in Hollywood, he understood that if he wanted to be accepted, the very essence of who he was would have to be edited out of the frame. However, most of Rock's co-stars, directors, and others knew he was gay. And since he was such a likable guy, they kept his secret, Griffin told NPR. So it is sort of a conspiracy of silence. But it's interesting that they're doing this because they really love this person that they're working with and feel protective of him. When Rock Hudson began his Hollywood career, it didn't go very smoothly. In fact, during his first screen test, it took him 27 takes to properly say one line. Hudson was one of the subjects in the 2020 Netflix series Hollywood, and producer Ryan Murphy explained that Rock struggled with insecurity, was nervous, and inexperienced. Murphy told the New York Post, When he started out, he was filled with self-hatred as many gay people are and were. All of that takes a while to get rid of. Studio executives apparently had faith in the burgeoning actor despite his embarrassing screen test and Hudson had time to cultivate some self-confidence because Hollywood made so many films. Hudson made nearly 70 films, including 1956's Giant. He also made movies with Doris Day, such as 1959's Pillow Talk and 1961's Lover Come Back. Other well-known films include Magnificent Obsession, Never Say Goodbye, and A Farewell to Arms. While Rock Hudson's filmography is fairly impressive, he did end up turning down some significant parts. According to Classic Movie Hub, because he chose to make 1957's A Farewell to Arms, he was unable to take the role offered to Marlon Brando in Sayonara, or Charlton Heston's famous role in Ben-Hur. These two films were massively successful both critically and commercially. Sayonara won four Academy Awards, and Brando was nominated for Best Actor. Meanwhile, Ben-Hur won 11 Academy Awards. Unfortunately, A Farewell to Arms was a giant flop. The film centered on the love affair between an English nurse and an American soldier in Italy during World War I. Hudson later confessed that making the movie was the biggest mistake of his career. The film was received so badly that David O. Selznick stopped producing movies after its release. Ironically, despite its failure, Hudson was still the number one box office attraction in 1957. In the book Giant, Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, James Dean, Edna Ferber, and The Making of a Legendary American Film by Don Graham. The author reveals some juicy details about the 1956 film that centered on a Texas cattle rancher. The film starred Hudson and James Dean, who butted heads on set. During an interview with Fox News, Graham had this to say, Rock Hudson absolutely hated James Dean and vice versa. The pair clashed the entire time, and co-star Elizabeth Taylor tried to get the two to make peace between one another. In the process, 
Taylor and Hudson became very close. She was also friends with Dean. Graham pointed out in his Fox News interview, in a way, the two of them were competing for her affections, just as in the film. The biggest point of contention was that people on set didn't like Dean's different acting style and antics. He didn't hit the right marks, he mumbled his words, and his way of embodying the character was contrary to Hudson's and Taylor's way of acting. Graham explained, James just blew that all off, and that made them really mad. In addition, Hudson enjoyed spending time drinking and hanging out with Taylor into the early morning, and Dean tried to cut in and disturb their friendship. Hudson was afraid Dean was monopolizing both his friend and the film. Author Don Graham wrote in his book Giant that Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor enjoyed spending their nights eating chocolate and drinking vodka. Even though they needed to be on set by 6 a.m., they would often enjoy each other's company until 3 a.m. The pair also reportedly came up with a signature drink during these visits, the chocolate martini. According to the book Rock Hudson, His Story, the close friends concocted the cocktail in Marfa, Texas during their downtime. Since they loved martinis as well as chocolate, it made sense to combine chocolate liqueur, chocolate syrup, and vodka to make a martini. They loved the taste but also had to deal with a little indigestion as a result. Hudson said in the book, We were really just kids. We could eat and drink anything and we never needed sleep. In his biography about Rock Hudson, author Mark Griffin indicates that the actor may have had a daughter or two that no one knew about. In 2014, a woman named Susan Dent claimed that she was Hudson's biological daughter and sued the actor's estate. She allegedly didn't want any financial compensation, but wanted to be recognized as his offspring. Hudson's adoptive sister was reportedly in possession of a letter about the situation written by Rock, and the author claimed that more than one person he interviewed for his book said that Hudson had two daughters by two different women. However, Griffin did not find or receive any evidence to support this. Meanwhile, Dent allegedly convinced some of Hudson's relatives to submit to a DNA test so she could prove she was biologically Hudson's daughter. She spent years in court trying to establish paternity, but it was never conclusively proven that she was his child. After Hudson's death in 1985, his estate was purportedly transferred to the Motion Picture and Television Country House and Hospital. In addition to Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson was also close with his frequent co-star Doris Day. The pair starred in 1959's Pillow Talk and had a friendship that endured until his death, according to People. In 2011, the actress revealed that she didn't know anything about her handsome co-star before they met. She thought his name was odd, but once she got to know him, she enjoyed his company because he was funny and had a good sense of humor. He would jokingly call her Eunice and other names. Doris recalled that she and Hudson had a, quote, marvelous time together. We certainly had wonderful times, haven't we? So wonderful. Their film Pillow Talk was a huge success and earned Day her only Best Actress Academy Award nomination. They also starred in the 1961 film Lover Come Back and 1964's Send Me No Flowers. Even after Hudson received his AIDS diagnosis, he chose to appear on Day's variety show in July 1985. And you know what? What? I am thrilled that you are going to do my show. I you're my am too. You're my I first am... guest. This was before Hudson went public with the news of his diagnosis. Day was shocked by his emaciated appearance but embraced her friend when they got together. During their last visit, the actor was very sick and weak, and Day even offered to feed him. Day explained, I think the reason people liked our movies is because they could tell how much we liked each other. It came across that way on screen. He was a good friend. Journalist Randa Handler interviewed Rock Hudson in 1985, just a couple of days before he revealed to the world that he had AIDS and was admitted to the hospital for a liver infection. She visited him at his Southern California estate near Coldwater Canyon. When Handler waited for Hudson to change out of his swimsuit, she checked out his library, where she observed hundreds of classic novels. During their conversation, the actor talked about his love for antiquing and his desire to see the film Cocoon by director Ron Howard. When Handler asked him about famous women in Hollywood, including Elizabeth Taylor, Doris Day, and Jane Wyman, he said that the one who impacted him the most was Katharine Hepburn. Hudson had a tremendous admiration for Hepburn and dubbed her a legend. He loved how she was able to express her emotions and bring the characters she played on screen to life. 
As for whether he would change anything about his life, Hudson said he wouldn't. However, he did say that if he wasn't an actor, he would have become a gardener because he loved to, quote, watch things grow and bloom. From 1962 to 1985, Hudson lived in The Castle in Beverly Hills. He spent two decades restoring the Spanish-style home, which sat on 3.5 acres and contained a greenhouse with orchids. In July 1985, Hudson collapsed at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, and he was admitted to the American Hospital of Paris to cope with complications from AIDS. The actor was in France to meet French army doctor Dominique Dermont, who'd secretly treated Hudson several months earlier. Hudson's publicist, Dale Olson, sent a telegram to the Reagan White House in an attempt to get the actor transferred to the military hospital, where he could receive necessary medical treatment. The commanding officer would not admit Hudson, but Olson thought a request from the White House would help. First Lady Nancy Reagan denied the request. White House staff member Mark Weinberg explained to The Guardian, The Reagans were very conscious of not making exceptions for people just because they were friends of theirs or celebrities or things of that kind. But there is a strong speculation that the nature of the virus kept Reagan from intervening and helping the actor. At the time, the Reagan administration was dealing with a lot of criticism related to its anti-LGBTQ response to the AIDS crisis. The only thing that can halt the spread of AIDS right now is a change in the behavior of those Americans who are at risk. Eventually, Hudson was admitted to the military hospital with some help from French Defense Minister Charles Hernou. Unfortunately, he died on October 2, 1985. Jeff Bridges has been in somewhere around 100 movies, but since the 1998 cult hit The Big Lebowski, he's always and forever going to be the dude. Bridges doesn't even mind being thought of that way, and in a lot of ways, he's the dude in real life. Here's the untold truth of Jeff Bridges. I'm the dude, so that's what you call me. Like father, like son. It's no secret that the Bridges family is pretty much Hollywood royalty. Jeff's father, Lloyd Bridges, who passed away in 1998, was an icon of the silver screen, but it was his off-camera demeanor that most affected his son. Jeff told The Hollywood Reporter, He loved all aspects of show business, knowing the crews, the traveling, the adventures you get involved in. He reveled in everything from the actual work to signing autographs and doing interviews. I think the thing that I, I learned most about the acting from him was um, just the joy in which he approached the thing. When you're joyous, it's contagious. All in the family. Jeff's big brother, Bo Bridges, is also a Hollywood star, but the two of them started their showbiz careers in a much less glamorous fashion, staging improvised mock fight scenes in grocery store parking lots on the back of a flatbed truck. Jeff told NPR, We would pull into a supermarket, and we would stage this fake fight, and a crowd would gather around in the parking lot to watch these two guys go at each other, and then they'd try to break up our fight, and we'd say, No, we're putting on a show. Serving his country Bridges isn't just an actor, he's also a military veteran, having spent seven years in the Coast Guard Reserves. He told AV Club that the back-breaking work was a far cry from Hollywood. I was chipping paint when I was in the Coast Guard while on a buoy tender, and being stationed there for several weeks, we would start at the bow and chip paint, and then paint it. And by the time you're down at the stern, it's time to start all over again. Still, he values the fond memories of his time in the Coast Guard, and they value him right back. In 2011, he, Brother Bo, and Father Lloyd were all awarded the Lone Sailor Award in recognition of their service. The Dude Cometh Being the son of a big star may have given him a head start in Hollywood, but Bridges wasn't always sure he wanted to take it. Even after snagging a Best Supporting Actor nomination in 1971 for The Last Picture Show, Bridges wasn't convinced acting was what he truly wanted to do. So, in 1973, he accepted a role in The Iceman Cometh specifically because he didn't actually want to do it. He figured it would be a good test of whether he wanted to stay in acting professionally. He told The Telegraph, For eight weeks, I was hanging out with all of these great old actors that I admired, and seeing how they dealt with their own anxieties, all of that led me to feel I could do this for the rest of my life. And to think, if things had gone the other way, we never would have gotten the dude. I don't watch my movies on TV, except like if that comes on. I'll say, well, I'll just wait till Turturro licks the ball, and then, but then I'll get hooked, man. He lives in a whorehouse. The Michael Cimino western Heaven's Gate has the dubious distinction of being one of the biggest box office failures in movie history, and a misery for cast, crew, and studio execs alike. 
Considering how zen Bridges is, though, it's no surprise to learn that he actually has fond memories of the shoot, saying on Facebook, Michael Cimino was a splendid filmmaker. Getting to work with him was a great pleasure and honor, a real stroke of luck, a blessing. In fact, Bridges enjoyed the experience so much that when the film ended, he bought the set of the film's Hog Ranch Whorehouse, moved it to his ranch in Montana, and still lives in it today. Photographer Besides being a great actor, Bridges is also an artist and a photographer, winning an Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography in 2013. For years, Bridges has been taking a ton of candid, behind-the-scenes photos from the sets of his movies, and they're pretty amazing. According to Esquire, his hobby started while he was filming Starman in 1984 and has continued throughout his career. In 2006, he put out a book of his photos titled Pictures, with sales also raising money for a nonprofit that provides Hollywood industry workers with support post-retirement. The Dude Abides Fans of The Big Lebowski should be psyched to know that when it comes to heavy stuff like politics, climate change, and religion, Bridges definitely has some opinions that would make the Dude Reno proud. A devoted activist, Bridges has been a longtime supporter of the No Kid Hungry campaign. He's on the Council of Every Town for Gun Safety, and as a supporter of the Plastic Pollution Coalition, he writes into his contract that no plastic containers will be used on the sets of his films. And, like the dude, Bridges is also into exploring the limits of the human mind. A devoted disciple of meditation and suppression therapy, Bridges designed a labyrinth for his yard and once volunteered to be a test subject in experiments with sensory deprivation. Bridges told GQ that the secret to resolving human conflict is developing and practicing empathy and celebrating our differences. It's the same fight that everyone has with everyone. Everyone. And basically, the fight is, you don't get it. None of us, none of us get each other. So you just have to be with that and have a relationship with it. And uh, usually what happens, if you hang with it enough, your love has to get bigger to hold that misunderstanding, that mystery. Wise words indeed. Now, if only every argument could be ended by simply saying, Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man.